Noam Chomsky has been a leading intellectual of the left for more than 35 years and has written about and spoken to a variety of issues including capitalist economics, the nation state focusing on an extensive critique of the powers that be and the policies of the United States, education, socialism, war and peace, and anarchism. He began his career in the study of language and is credited with the creation of the theory of generative grammar, considered to be one of the most significant contributions to the field of linguistics made in the 20th century. Recently, Professor Chomsky, author of over 30 books of science and of politics, has been the subject of an interview, along with Gilbert Ashkar, by New Jersey-based political scientist Stephen Shalom in the book titled Perilous Power, the Middle East and U.S. Foreign Policy. In this book, he discusses, among other things, the resurgence of religious fundamentalism in both the Middle East and within this country, and offers some perspective on what might be the cause or causes of the trend. Also, in a recent interview in The Humanist, the flagship magazine of the American Humanist Association, Professor Chomsky continues his analysis of religious fundamentalism, as well as talks about other issues at the core of the humanist worldview. Equal Time for Free Thought spoke to Professor Chomsky a few weeks ago on the substance of humanist thought from naturalism and religious critique to the political and economic structures which must be in place in order for us to effect the social changes necessary toward creating a humanistic future world society. Here is part one of that discussion. First, let me say uh, that Equal Time for Free Thought is very happy to have you join us today, Professor Chomsky. Your work covers much ground on the human condition from language and the understanding of human consciousness to humanity's social political relationships and further to the way we share Earth's natural and human-made resources and still more. Equal Time for Free Thought's central mission is to promote a scientific naturalist worldview in understanding the human condition, which of course includes much of what I laid out regarding your intellectual curriculum. The end result for us is a set of principles and ideas which together form a larger philosophy or way of seeing the world, which though not exactly the same thing as conceived by each one of us at every moment, we call humanism. To begin this conversation, uh, I, I'll give this to my co-host, Neil Murphy. Neil? Thank you very much, Barry. Professor Chomsky, welcome to Equal Time for Free Thought. Very glad to be with you. Thank you. Uh, a few months ago, The Humanist, which is the magazine of the American Humanist Association, published their interview with you on humanism and other related free thought questions. Now, before we move forward, do you consider yourself a humanist, and if so, what characteristics would you include in such a philosophy? Let me begin by quoting a philosopher friend of mine who once had to write a critical analysis of work of mine and he started off by saying that kind of scratching his head he said the problem with me is that the only ism i believe in is truism hmm. so which is not entirely false so yeah there are things i agree with but i don't associate myself with any particular ism now modern humanism is said to be based on scientific naturalism um, and our philosophy is informed by what we learn about the universe and ourselves through the physical and social sciences. Do you feel that naturalism is the most appropriate point of view toward understanding what sort of creatures we are? I think it's, that's, what I, that's my professional life, so sure. I think it's a fine thing to do, but the truth of the matter is that uh, these are, from the point of view of science, most of these topics are almost inaccessible. Uh, and for now, and I suspect for the indefinite future, we'll probably learn more about human beings from uh, literature than we will from science. Mm, that's an interesting point. Why, why would you say that? Science deals with questions that are at the periphery of understanding. To try to understand the nature of insects is difficult enough. When you reach anything as complicated as humans, uh, it's, uh, it becomes an extremely hard problem. Uh, one reason is that we can't do... Uh, invasive experimentation with humans. So when you want to study, I mean, we happen to know a lot about the human visual system, for example. But the reason is because we permit ourselves, rightly or wrongly, uh, to do invasive experimentation with uh, cats and monkeys, and we have a more or less similar visual system. But uh, humans are a very unusual creature, biologically isolated in many respects, and we don't really learn a lot about them from uh, uh, some, but not a lot from the uh, investigations we allow ourselves to conduct with uh, other organisms. That's one impediment to understanding. Another is it's just very complicated. What is your view overall on supernaturalism? Now, for the moment, let's separate this from what we might call religion, which can mean several things like established churches and organized ideology. Do you think holding a supernatural worldview is healthy and beneficial for humanity? It's not for me. I don't see any point to it at all. Uh, on the other hand, I know that it means 
religious beliefs and other forms of supernatural doesn't happen to mean a lot to a lot of people. Uh, if I find someone who's, uh, say, mourning the loss of a dead child and is uh, comforted by the idea that they'll uh, be reunited with the child in heaven, it's not my business to take to try to convince them that their belief is incorrect. In fact, in a way, I think they're lucky to be able to have such a belief. Uh, I don't have it, and I don't think in the long run it's healthy. But uh, we can't legislate to other people uh, what they should believe in order to, uh, say, comfort themselves. It almost sounds like you have a laissez-faire attitude towards religious belief. In other words, as long as one person's private morality doesn't interfere with someone else's, then you can sort of live and let live. Is that a fair assessment? Absolutely fair. Okay. What in general do you feel then about religion's role in human society, both historically and here in the 21st century? Overall, I think it's, uh, in terms of its effect on policy, ranging from you know, social policy to war, I think it's been mostly negative. In fact, often extremely negative. Uh, with regard to individuals, it varies. For a lot of people, it just means a lot and always has. What do you attribute to that? Do you think there's something biological, like many people have argued that we're sort of hardwired for religion? Do you think that religion is sort of keeping in lockstep with evolutionary processes? Well, first of all, we know very little about the evolution of humans in any relevant respect. I mean, we know a lot about uh, you know the fossil record and so on. But when you get to human uh, cognitive capacities or uh, uh, and so you know higher, what we call sometimes higher mental faculties. Uh, the evolutionary record is just extremely thin. Uh, we're a very recent product of evolution. Uh, modern humans, from a cognitive perspective, cognitive behavioral perspective, uh, only emerged within roughly the last 100,000 years, which is a, like a flick of an eye in evolutionary time. And uh, we're all more or less identical. Uh, uh, there's very little genetic variation among relevant genetic variation among humans because there's been you know, we probably come from a small breeding group somewhere in East Africa you know probably no later than say 50,000 years ago there's no time for anything to have happened uh, and uh, uh, to see we can, in, in a sense it's like almost in my view virtually a tautology to say that the uh, a commitment to religious belief is the result of evolution because we're the result of evolution. Just like my, you know, my chin is, my toenails are. So so are my uh, higher mental faculties. But that just doesn't tell you very much. I mean, we all know without uh, playing, kind of doing pop science, that uh, people do want to find ways to uh, give an intelligible picture of the universe around them. Uh, to uh, find uh, comfort, to find association with others. And they do it in all kinds of ways. Some of them we call religion. Uh, a lot of, uh, uh, some of it we call uh, magic. Uh, in modern, in the modern period, period of the rise of organized modern science, of course, goes way back, but uh, really as a major uh, phenomenon in human life, there's been a concerted attempt to explain, to gain an understanding of the world by means that do permit confirmation, disconfirmation, uh, uh, building on the results of others, and so on, as we call science. Okay, that we should push that as far as we can. Uh, surely we want to understand as much as we can about the world, and that's the best way to understand it. Do you think that religion overall, I'm talking here about monotheistic religions, Christianity, Judaism, and Islam, do you think that it's the case that religious believers are asking the right questions about the meaning of life and creating some type of order, but that the solutions are dangerous? Well, personally, I don't think they're asking the right questions about life. Hmm. But, uh, and that's why I don't ask those questions. So uh, Jewish in background, but I don't repeat the uh, I believe uh, X, y, and Z. all the X, Ys, and Zs that you're supposed to do because I don't believe them. And I, don't, and I don't see any reason to believe them. Uh, my grandfather did repeat them. And uh, whether he believed them or not, I frankly don't even know, because uh, Judaism, traditional Judaism, was more a religion of practice than of belief. So he observed, he's very orthodox, but he observed the practices, and I never asked him, did he believe what he was saying, because it kind of wasn't relevant. That's not what the religion was. Now, there are others who may believe, choose to believe, let's say, this or other monotheistic religions, but I don't 
see it, and it's the same laissez-faire attitude, if you like. If that's if that kind of belief uh, contributes to people's uh, sense of where they stand in the world, uh, personal comfort, uh, identification with the community, and so on, well, that's their choice. It's quite a different matter when uh, their choices impinge on what uh, others do. So I think we should have, uh, for example, I was appalled the other day when uh, um, I was listening to uh, reports, I probably was on NPR, or maybe I was reading reports of uh, Mitt Romney's first uh, uh, talk on the, maybe it was the Republican debate, you know, one of those places where he gave, where he, yeah, I was listening to pieces of it, and he gave a, um, what was considered a very high-minded uh, speech about uh, the role of religion in politics. He said the word something like this, that the uh, constitu- we, we should keep to the constitutional separation of church and state, which means that it doesn't matter what faith a president has, but of course, it's presupposed that he must be uh, committed to one of the monotheistic religions. Yeah. That's not what the, what that amendment says. I find it interesting that in today's political climate, it almost seems that you have to be close to a religious extremist to be taken seriously. I mean, if you listen to even uh, John Kerry in the '04 election, um, he was trying to profess his, you know, Catholic beliefs as a kind of uh, litmus test for his legitimacy. Does that trend in American politics concern you? Very much so. It's extremely dangerous. I think it's extremely cynical. I mean, the, the U.S. has been a uh, deeply fundamentalist society since its origins. I mean, the early colonists were religious extremists, you know, uh, and the various waves of colonization. That, the Puritans in New England. Yeah, that spread across the country uh, also were, you know, waving the holy book while they exterminated the heathens and that sort of thing. Uh, but uh, And there have been repeated... Uh, periods of religious revivalism. It's kind of like a mass hysteria of religious revivalism. The most recent uh, and quite significant one was in the 1950s, not that far back, and there, there are others. Uh, since 1970, around 1980, I guess, uh, something new has happened. The religious fundamentalism has been p- uh, political managers, party managers, and so on, recognized something that they'd kind of ignored before that uh, you can manipulate uh, religious beliefs, extremist religious beliefs, uh, into a creation of a voting bloc. And since about 1980, uh, what you describe has been the case. Uh, every, just about every candidate for high office, a president, uh, portrays themselves, whether accurately or not, uh, as a, you know, a person of deep religious faith. Uh, I suspect some of them are about as religious as you and I are. Right. Say Clinton. Yeah, and for instance, Carl Rove has repeatedly said that you know he's not. In fact, he was mentioned in a recent article that he's not one of them. In other words, that they're cynically manipulating this base for their own personal power. So it's not that they're sincerely motivated by religious concerns, but they see this base as a way of ensuring their own self-interest. Is that a fair assessment? I I didn't see that comment, but that's that's the way. Uh, I, that's what I conclude from just observing what's been happening. I suspect, I, I've never really seen a study of this, but I suspect that it began with Carter, who was undoubtedly quite sincere. But he's the first president who sort of went out of his way to present himself, portray himself as a deeply believing Christian. You know. And I think party managers got the point. Uh, yeah, you can... Uh, use that uh, way of appealing to a substantial electoral base. And since starting with the 1980 election, I, I, I think it's just been just about every candidate. In 1980, I recall, there were three candidates, uh, Carter, Reagan, Anderson, all presented themselves as, uh, or their managers, you know, their handlers presented them as uh, uh, deeply religious. Whether they were or not, who knows. I'm Carter probably, I'm sure, was, I don't know about the others. And since then, that's been the case. And it's extremely cynical. Uh, and it's, uh, for, for example, nobody cared very much whether, say, uh, Lyndon Johnson or Richard Nixon went to church. Maybe they did, maybe they didn't, but it wasn't an issue. It wasn't relevant. It, it didn't pay a lot of attention to it. Uh, since, uh, in these last uh, roughly 25 years, uh, it's right in the front. And, of course, it's not called religion anymore. It's called faith. Everything has to be faith-based, meaning uh, some 
form of uh, commitment, dedication to one of the organized religions, leading ultimately to the kind of comment from Romney that I mentioned, which was lauded, whereas it should have been bitterly denounced. Hmm. Uh, and yes, that's had a very negative impact in a lot of respects, as is intended. I mean, it's a way to, uh, from the point of view of party managers, it's a way to marginalize, control, and atomize a population that they're afraid of. I mean, they can read the same opinion polls you and I can, and they know perfectly well that uh, the positions of the two political parties are two, sometimes they're called two factions of the same party on many crucial issues way to the right of the population. So therefore, elections have to keep away from issues, as they do. I want to follow up on the point you made about faith, because it almost seems that there's a connection between, you know, the Republican Party and maybe in some ways the Democratic Party and a faith-based worldview, because if faith is believing something for which there is no evidence and the Republicans paint themselves as these sort of divine managers, for lack of a better phrase, it would seem that what the Republican electorate wants is a kind of submissive faith-based populist to secede their own political power and representation to them to sort of act on their interests, but yet at the same time, as you said, they're being cynically manipulated. Do you agree with that? If you look at the opinions of the Republican base, they are not being represented by the Republican Party. Uh, that's true on issue after issue. can't go through the details now, but there's a lot of detailed study of that I've done some and there's others. Uh, uh, the population, including the Republican part the Republican base, uh, is strongly opposed to policy on many crucial issues, uh, domestic and international. To give one example out of a thousand, sure. Uh, in the last electoral campaign, 2004, it turns out that Bush voters were barely aware of his policies. Some small percentage of them, maybe you know, two digits, were uh, familiar with his policies. Uh, in one case, and there are many, uh, a majority of people who voted for Bush thought that he supported the Kyoto Protocol. When he did not. Of course, it was strongly, you know, I don't know what he thinks, but his party was strongly against it. But people believed it, and they believed it because they're in favor of it, very, very strongly in favor of it, and he's a kind of a nice guy. That's the way he's presented in the imagery and delusion that passes for elections here. Uh, so he must believe it. And it's the same on a whole bunch of issues. In the Humanist Magazine interview, you talk about Americans as being one of the most, America, excuse me, as being one of the most fearful societies. Um, how does religion, in your opinion, come into play with regard to this fear? Organized religion can be used, and often is used, as a way to separate ourselves from menacing outsiders who don't share our fundamental belief. And that can be manipulated into... Uh, uh, creating fear. Actually, the the, the long-standing element of fear in, in American society, I think, has different origins. Uh, and you can see it when you ask, what are people afraid of? Uh, actually, there's quite a good study of this in literature, popular literature, by uh, Bruce Frank Franklin, uh, who studies uh, a, liter a literary scholar at uh, Rutgers called uh, War Stars. He, he runs through the striking theme of fear in popular American literature since colonial times. And it turns out that pretty consistently uh, people have been terrified of some group that they are destroying. So in the early days it was fear of the savage Indians. You know. Later it was fear of the blacks. Uh, then it was uh, fear of the heathen Chinese who were going to conquer us. This is the late 19th century. Uh, and uh, and so it continues. I mean, take, say, Ronald Reagan. Perhaps recall just 20 years ago, he was uh, cowering in his uh, cowboy boots about the threat of uh, the Nicaraguan army. Uh, only two days from Harlingen, Texas, had to call a national emergency, uh, informed the press that he remembers uh, Winston Churchill and how Churchill stood up for Hitler, and despite the odds against him, he, Reagan, will uh, not... Uh, be def you know, will not succumb to this awesome threat and we'll defend them ourselves and we'll defend ourselves. I mean, looking at this from the outside, you don't know whether to laugh or cry, laugh or cry you know, but yeah, that, that uh, strikes a chord. Regarding terrorism from the point of view of religious fundamentalism, there have been writers who have been dubbed the new atheists, like Sam Harris and Richard Dawkins, who feel that groups like the Muslim Brotherhood and Al-Qaeda 
are not acting on economic or even political motivations so much as they're acting on their conviction of how humans ought to act and think based on the Koran. Others would argue that the political motivations are what's driving the issues in the Middle East and not religious motivations. On this issue of religion as the chicken or the egg, what are your thoughts? Depends who you're talking about. I mean, uh, the, the, first of all, Muslim Brotherhood is not, a, is not essentially a terrorist group. It's a social and political group. I mean, it's been involved in terrorism, but who hasn't? Uh, <laughs> the, uh, uh, the, uh, uh, if, if you look at the appeal of groups like, uh, say, uh, the Muslim Brotherhood and its offshoots, like Hamas in uh, Israel, which is kind of offshoot of it, uh, or, uh, or Hezbollah in uh, Lebanon, they have a trans amount of popular appeal, but it's, it would be very misleading to say that it's religious, that there's an element of that. I mean, they prov provide uh, social services and uh, that the government doesn't make available. Uh, they, they're they're a kind of a populist a social and economic group. That's where their support comes from. It sounds. I'm sorry to uh, interject. I just wanted to get your opinion on this. It sounds like what you're saying is, because there are no secular nationalist alternatives, these groups are filling a vacuum that secular nationalist governments would fill. Is that a fair That's point? That's not only fair, but it's been concerted U.S. policy and concerted Israeli policy. Secular nationalism has been regarded by an, as an extreme threat. Uh, it, it's, and it finally collapsed, partly from its own internal corruption and so on, but partly just from the hammer blows against it. Uh, I'm going to take U.S. policy. Uh, Hamas, for example, well, its, its earlier manifestations in called themselves Hamas then, uh, were supported by Israel as a weapon against uh, secular Palestinian nationalism. Uh, the United States, uh, our oldest and most valued ally in the Middle East, is the most extreme fundamentalist tyranny in the world. You know, Saudi Arabia. By comparison, Iran looks like a modern, uh, developed society. Uh, and uh, the reason is, of course, you know, it's where the oil is. But uh, the U.S. was constantly backing, uh, uh, it, say, in the 60s, uh, uh, supporting Saudi Arabia against secular nationalism, represented by uh, Nasser, who was regarded as the main threat. He was you know, Hitler, as uh, Dulles called him, huh. Hitler. Yeah, secular nationalism has always been regarded as a major threat. You don't want that. It's, it's dangerous. Uh, might have appeal, might even begin to use resources for the population, the general population. That's a danger. And, very, you know, not 100%, but quite sy sy systematically, uh, U.S. policy and in their own region, Israeli oh. policy, uh, has tended to support religious fundamentalism as a weapon against secular nationalism. I mean, perhaps the most dramatic case is Pakistan, dangerous countries in the world, uh, with a strong element of religious extremism. Well, that was sponsored by Ronald Reagan. You know, in fact, uh, Reagan, there was a brutal dictator at the time, Reagan years, uh, Zeal Huck, who worked really hard to eliminate the secular elements in the society, brought in uh, Saudi Arabian money, poured in to uh, build the madrasas, you know, the religious schools, which became terrorist training schools, a lot of them. Uh, Reagan even went to the extent of... Uh, denying that uh, Pakistan was developing nuclear weapons, although the U.S. government, of course, knew, he w knew they were. And, you know, then we end up with, uh, you know, the con networks have been distributing uh, the, the nuclear weapons and missiles around the world. Uh, yeah, it was uh, strongly sponsored by the United States. When I say Reagan, I don't mean to imply that he actually knew about it. He may not have known anything about it. Uh, but his administration certainly did. Do you think overall, I'm, I'm going to ask, this might seem a little naive, but I'd like to get your opinion on this. Do you think religion overall is the main cause for conflict and suffering over the last thousand years in the sense of creating the conditions that we have in the 21st century? Or do you think that's a little bit simplistic? I think it's not a little bit, but enormously simplistic. I mean, just take the current period right now. Uh, uh, some of the worst, maybe the worst atrocities going on in the world in the last few years are in the eastern Congo, where estimates are maybe 4 million people killed. I don't think religion had anything significant to do about it. Uh, right now, the, uh, uh, the U.S. invaded Iraq, of course. Hundreds of thousands of people killed, uh, society devastated, you know, millions fleeing uh, uh, may move on to uh, conceivable. It might move on to attack Iran. There's no religion involved. In fact, the U.S. attacked a secular tyranny in Iraq. 
And you've been listening to part one of a discussion on humanism with Professor Noam Chomsky. Part two of our discussion will air next week at 6.30 p.m. Good evening, everyone. My name is Barry Seibert, and this is Equal Time for Free Thought, a forum to explore the evidence-based worldview built upon a foundation of scientific naturalism and secular humanism. On this program, we examine why we think such a worldview should be the basis of a progressive future society. Today, we are proud to present part two of a two-part series with famed political analyst Noam Chomsky. We've asked Professor Chomsky questions about religion, what he thought about human nature, as well as economics and political ideals that might help us articulate what we need to do towards a future humanist society. Noam Chomsky has been a leading intellectual of the left for more than 35 years and has written about and spoken to a variety of issues including capitalist economics, the nation state focusing on an extensive critique of the powers that be and the policies of the United States, as well as on education, socialism, war and peace, and anarchism. He began his career in the study of language and is credited with the creation of the theory of generative grammar, considered to be one of the most significant contributions to the field of linguistics made in the 20th century. Recently, Professor Chomsky, author of over 30 books of science and of politics, has been a subject of an interview, along with Gilbert Ashkar, by New Jersey-based political scientist Stephen Shalom in the book titled Perilous Power, the Middle East and U.S. Foreign Policy. Equal Time for Free Thought spoke to Professor Chomsky a few weeks ago on the substance of humanist thought from naturalism and religious critique to the political and economic structures which must be in place in order for us to affect the social changes necessary toward creating a humanistic future world society. Here is part two of that discussion. Last week we began our talk on religion with the discussion of supernaturalism and naturalism. The primary attribute of supernatural thinking is that there are magical entities or forces which control the fate of humanity. On the contrary, most naturalists argue that humans are actually just one sort of animal, very much a part of the natural world. This then means that our behaviors are determined by some combination of a genetic makeup and the environment from birth to death act, and how that environment acts on those genes. Do you think such a naturalism leaves open the possibility of free will, which seems to contradict our notion of cause and effect universe? No, it doesn't contradict anything. It just says that uh, we don't know whether uh, the phenomenon that we all experience, it's our most immediate experience, the phenomenon of freedom of will uh, is a real aspect of the universe that we simply don't comprehend uh, yet or maybe ever or whether it's an illusion that can be explained in some other fashion. Uh, That question just remains open. Uh, There's plenty of things we don't understand. For example, we don't really have uh, an intuitive grasp of something which now naturalists take for granted, uh, namely that uh, if I move my hand, I'm moving the moon, that there can be interaction at a distance. Uh, When Newton proposed that, uh, he regarded it as a total absurdity. That's why he, uh, which is, he said, no person of sound scientific uh, understanding can imagine to be true for a moment. In fact, he spent the rest of his life trying to find some way to get around it, as did uh, leading uh, scientists of not only of his day, but for centuries afterwards. It finally became scientific common sense. Well, there are things about the world we just can't comprehend. Uh, and it's, uh, we don't know how far. If we are uh, just part of the animal world, as I believe, and I think you believe, mm-hmm. uh, then our cognitive capacities are going to be like all our other capacities. They'll have a certain scope, and they'll have certain limits. Uh, that's the nature of a biological organism. So you're, you're suggesting that until we mo- know more uh, about the workings of the human mind, or you know, that neuroscience is, is starting to show us, we can't definitely come down uh, one way or another on the free will question. It's more of a, a matter of intuition and, and still in the realm of philosophy. And Bertrand Russell pointed out uh, back in the 1920s, and I think correctly, that there are several grades of confidence that we have or we should have in our uh, belief system. The highest confidence is in our immediate experience. Mm-hmm. The second level of con- confidence, he said, is in the reports of immediate experience by others who are like us. And the third level, the lowest level of confidence, would be in the scientific constructions that we develop to try to make some sense out of our experience. Well, you know, our most immediate experience, I can't think of anything more immediate and uh, less questionable, is that... Uh, I could decide right now to, say, hang up the phone or start talking about, uh, you know, the Boston Red Sox or a thousand Mm -hmm. other things, but I'm not going to do it because it wouldn't be appropriate. Uh, Our most immediate experience is that we act in ways which are somehow 
appropriate situations, which is quite different than saying they're caused by them. Now, maybe there is some way of accounting for our choices uh, in terms of the circumstances in which we're placed and uh, Mm. something internal to us. But, you know, that's a a thesis. It's certainly counterintuitive, and and, uh, I think uh, philosophers who discuss, uh, who call themselves determinists, like uh, your friend of mine, Ted Hondrick, uh, would argue that it is counterintuitive, and it might be easier to dismiss what they call counter-causal free will um, uh, than to affirm uh, pure determinism, but it is it is a very complex question. I don't even believe that it's a complex question. Mm-hmm. I think it's something that we simply do not know. Mm-hmm. There are a lot of things we don't know. One of them is whether the immediate experience of freedom of will is an illusion or whether it is, in fact, uh, an aspect of the universe that we have not yet come to comprehend and that our cognitive capacities may not allow us to comprehend. Just as our cognitive capacities, if we are serious about it, are like Newton's. They do not like uh, allow us to comprehend the fact that uh, action uh, without contact is possible. We accept it, and we understand theories about it, but there's a big difference between intelligibility of theories and intelligibility of the world. In fact, what happened in the Newtonian revolution, took a long time for it to sink in, was that the uh, aspirations of science were lowered. Uh, in the early modern scientific revolution, say Galileo up through Newton and beyond, uh, the assumption was, guiding idea was, that the world is like is a kind of a complicated machine, sort of like a clock, you know, one of the fancy clocks that artisans right. built, just a lot more complicated. And we can understand it. And, we, and our goal is to try to gain the understanding of how this machine works. Well, when Newton came along, uh, he was accused of reviving occult forces, <laughs> things that a machine can't have, like action at a distance. Uh, and he real, he more or less accepted that. And, you know, he's not a fool, Newton, nor were the other great scientists of the day. Uh, and, in fact, if you look at what really happened over time, the aspirations were lowered, the goals of science were lowered, from intelligibility of the world, which we kind of give up, to intelligibility of theoretical explanations of the world, Mm -hmm. which we hold and try to pursue. Well, the reason why I'm asking this question at all, uh, because I think it might be uh, important due to uh, the understanding it might offer us and how we treat one another, especially with regard to, say, the criminal justice system. For instance, if we understand that we're not ultimately responsible for our actions, as determinists say, we might want to alter our rather punitive methodology methodology regarding punishment and reward and we focus our efforts on creating a healthier environment from the get-go. I, th- I think, I mean, I agree with your goal, We should what you're describing, but I think that's totally independent of what uh, speculations we have about uh, the nature of freedom of the will. We do it anyway. I mean, in our ordinary lives and in, in human affairs, we simply take for granted that uh, people have freedom of will just as we see in ourselves, and that they therefore have moral responsibilities. Uh, how we proceed to... Uh, deal with uh, the questions that arise. That's a matter of uh, the level of humanity and of civilization that we've achieved. Uh, For example, really serious problems in the United States about this. Mm. Uh, Take, for example, incarceration. I mean, the U.S. is just off the chart Mm. in incarceration. And it's not, you know, in our culture. You go back 25 years, it wasn't true. It was the same society 25 years ago, and uh, incarceration levels were within the spectrum of other industrial societies, a little bit toward the high end, but not much. And now they're off the chart. Uh, did our culture change? It takes a incarceration of children. Children with life... Uh, Amnesty International did a report about a year or so ago on uh, a cross-country examination of uh, children who are in prison for life without possibility of parole. Well, they're, they're very few. I think there's a couple of thousand around the world. I mean, in countries which have any sort of statistics, I'm not talking about Eastern Congo, uh, the, uh, and the United States had almost all of them. Mm-hmm. I mean, that's just scandalous. A kid is in prison for life without possibility of parole because when they were 12 years old, they happened to be at the scene of a robbery uh, where a felony was committed. Uh, you know how to comment on this? This has absolutely nothing to do with what we 
what speculations we may have about the nature of freedom of will. Well, I, I want to get into those kind of questions which had to do with the state of our economics and the like, but just as a sort of a segue into that and coming from the free will question, what do you think, behaviorally speaking, humans primarily are? That is, do you think we have a sort of Hobbesian human nature or plastic human nature or, or something else? Because this seems to, uh, when you hear either conservatives or liberals or, or people on the far right or far left discuss what kind of policies and what kind of, of economics and what uh, we should have, you know, how we should deal with the rest of the world, it usually always, or often comes back, at least to justify their opinions, it always comes back to, well, this is what humans are, and this is therefore more natural for us to do A, you know, have a capitalist society, or B, have a socialist society. What do you think uh, is the basic human nature that, or do you think that we have a basic human nature? I believe that we are part of the natural world, Okay. Mm -hmm. Therefore, we have a nature. Uh, it's our genetic endowment determines substantially what our nature is. Uh, in fact, if you look at the growth of any organism, us, bees, uh, you know, yeast, whatever you like, uh, there are actually three factors that enter into its growth and development. Uh, one is its genetic constitution, another is environmental effects, and a third is just the way laws of nature work, which is a turns out as a major effect. Uh, and the uh, inquiry into biological organisms uh, takes all of those into account, or should. Uh, as for our uh, the, uh, human nature, the genetic endowment that we essentially share, very little is known about it. I mean, it's just a really hard question. And as I mentioned in our earlier discussion, uh, a lot of the ways of studying it are excluded simply because we don't allow invasive experimentation. Mm -hmm. uh, the, uh, uh, and it, and it, you know, it, it's hard enough to learn about insect nature, mm -hmm. uh, where we allow ourselves anything. Well, uh, and they're much simpler organisms. So what do we know about human nature? Well, most of our knowledge comes from history, experience, uh, literary exploration, and so on. That's what our knowledge comes from. What does it tell us? It tells us that, uh, of course... Humans are partially plastic, like uh, I don't speak Swahili, for example, so we're partially plastic. Uh, on the other hand, uh, there's, there has to be an enormous uniformity at a level right below the surface. And what we see on the surface is a wide range of possibilities. I mean, we see people who are acting in a beastly fashion. Uh, we see others who are uh, kind of sacrificing their lives to save dolphins. One of the uh, the sciences, uh, and I'm not sure if it would be categorized the hard science or soft science, or it's a it's an emerging uh, science, evolutionary psychology. People like uh, E.O. Wilson and Steven Pinker have come around and and said they understand what human nature is, and, and it's based on this new science. Are you saying then that they're either still just guessing, or do they have some some scientific backing that uh, from what you have, if you have read any of their work? Yes, I know their work. Uh, and I know a lot of them. Uh, what's now called evolutionary psychology was, in fact, initiated uh, about a century ago, over a century ago, by uh, Peter Kropotkin, the anarchist right. thinker and naturalist, who wrote a book called uh, Mutual Aid, a Factor in Evolution. Mm -hmm. uh, and in it, he investigated, uh, he, he was basically trying to counter social Darwinist. He was Darwin Darwinist himself, and he argued by looking at a lot of... Uh, naturalistic phenomena, other animals, uh, human history, and so on, he argued that if you look at it, you discover that uh, mutual aid had a uh, provided a selectional advantage, and therefore uh, organisms were had evolved through selection, uh, including humans, to uh, uh, be uh, uh, deeply committed to one or another form of mutual aid. Well, you know, that's not what elite opinion wants to hear. Mm. Uh, they want to hear some other story. Uh, so therefore, Kropotkin's form of evolutionary psychology essentially disappeared. Right. It's been revived to some extent. The actual modern, the modern state of evolutionary psychology, as a, I mean, it's not that there's no science there at all. There's some, you know, like say, kin selection is real, uh, reciprocal altruism is real, uh, a couple other things are real, but very little is known. It's thin. You know, this is not. Uh, uh, physics, and it's not molecular biology, it's not chemistry. It's uh, largely guesses. Not, it's a worthwhile topic to pursue. You know, I think it's a fine topic to pursue. Uh, in fact, that's where my own professional work is in particular areas. But we should, uh, scientists particularly 
should be very cautious about inducing the and deluding the public to think that they know more than they do. Mm -hmm. Science is held in enormous respect for good reasons, and therefore scientists have a responsibility to make very clear, here's what we know and here's what we don't know. Uh, and what we know in these areas happens to be extremely thin, not because they're not good scientists, but because the questions are too hard. So you consider yourself an anarchist or libertarian socialist, uh, I believe. One species of anarchist, pardon the phrase, since we're talking about biology and all, is called free market anarchists. Um, they argue that markets, um, market societies become a problem only via corporate capitalism or... Uh, as in me, uh, Milton Friedman's brand of conservative libertarianism, and that market abolitionism is tossing out the baby with the bathwater. Do you think there can be a place for markets in in a non-capitalistic, perhaps even non-statist society? I know we're sort of quickly jumping into this. Maybe we should backtrack a little bit and discuss what, what, what you think about uh, well, capitalism and markets well, first. First of all, I mean, uh, I have to kind of give the same response that uh, Gandhi gave when he was asked what he thought about Western civilization. <laughs> Maybe it'd be a good idea. Right, right. Okay, one can say the same about markets. Maybe it would be a good idea. Uh, but there are no market societies. I mean, the only market societies that, you know, the, the only social systems that approximate market societies are poor, colonized, underdeveloped countries where it's been rammed down the throats. And that goes way back. I mean, if the United States, say, had ever been a market society we would now be pursuing our comparative advantage of exporting uh, uh, fish and fur, a few scattered people who lived here. Uh, the U.S. developed, as did every other rich and developed society, by a radical violation of market principles, extremely high tariffs, the most protectionist country in the world through its period of growth, uh, uh, state intervention to uh, uh, manage and control industry, industrial policy. Uh, right at this moment, uh, it, it's, it's essentially a logical impossibility for the United States to enter into free trade agreements because our own economy uh, depends crucially on the state sector. That's where we get mm -hmm. computers and uh, the Internet and telecommunications and uh, uh, the containers that allow trade and uh, lasers and you know, aircraft. Just look across the board. It relies very heavily on the state sector for its dynamism, its uh, innovation, and so on. So it's re very remote from a free market society, and uh, so is every other one that had choices. Uh, the societies that it, um, take, say, the modern so-called tigers, you know, the East Asian tigers with great growth period, uh, Taiwan, South Korea, China, Japan, uh, yeah, they did it the same way the currently rich societies did, namely by violating market rules. But you, you do separate, I assume, markets from capitalism itself. Correct. Well, I don't know what capitalism is supposed to be. If capitalism mm -hmm. is supposed to be a market society, it's never existed, except right. in countries where it's been rammed down the throat. Okay. Um, okay. Well, we have a situation now, obviously, in the United States, which is which is pretty terrible, um, and it is a statist society, and it is a capitalist society. Yeah. Um, do you think we ought to be shift back uh, to some sort of New Deal social welfare state model, like we saw in Scandinavia several decades ago? Um, you know, perhaps one, in other words, with, with even regulated markets, but not, you know, corporate capitalism, if that's possible. Do you think that's a, a remedy, or at least on the short term? First of all, the New Deal was a corporate state capitalist society. Uh, Roosevelt himself was strongly support, supported by a major sector of corporate capitalism. It's been shown by research of Thomas Ferguson and others. Uh, Roosevelt's, a lot of his strongest support was coming from the uh, high-tech uh, internationally oriented sector of uh, American state capitalism, like GE and others. Uh, and the modern corporation, you know, its modern form goes back about a century and earlier predecessors. Uh, but uh, uh, New Deal-style welfare state uh, measures were introduced under tremendous popular pressure, and that has extended. I mean, there wasn't any Medicare under the New Deal or Medicaid. Uh, popular pressure has continually uh, attempted to uh, bring about uh, a government involvement, intervention in uh, ensuring social welfare. I mean, for decades, uh, and right now, a uh, large majority of the population, usually runs around two-thirds or more, is in favor of uh, a national health care system of the kind that 
most other industrials, practically every other industrial society has. Something kind of like maybe Medicare extended to the population. That's an overwhelming majority of the population. Uh, and that's the highest domestic concern of people in poll after poll. Uh, right now, the latest polls, the highest concern is Iraq. Second highest concern is health care. Well, how come these measures aren't enacted? Well, because uh, they're regarded as by elites as what's called politically impossible, uh, meaning the insurance uh, Wall Street's opposed, the financial institutions are opposed, the pharmaceutical corporations are opposed. Uh, it doesn't matter if 90% of the population wants it. So therefore, it's not on the political agenda. It is interestingly getting on the political agenda now because a major sector of U.S. corporate state capitalism is supporting it, beginning to support it, namely manufacturing industry, uh, who are being harmed by the extreme inefficiency of the privatized health care system here. It's twice the per capita expenditures of any place in the world, other other industrial society, and some of the worst outcomes. I was asking about that because uh, whether it be New Deal or even uh, the Keynesian uh, kind of... uh model that we saw in Sweden in the 60s and 70s. There have been economists who have argued, uh, you know a few of them, Robin Hanel, Takis Fotopoulos, that um, the, this kind of social democracy has failed, not only because of outside pressure, uh, neoliberal global, globalization, but also because it's sort of putting a human face on capitalism, and it's capitalism itself that's the actual problem. So it's sort of putting a band-aid on a wound rather than curing it. What's your thoughts on on? on the social welfare state in that sense, even if we mean it to be something that's temporary in order to roll back the neoliberal agenda? Well, I think, take someone who's a committed revolutionary, you know, thinks we really have to throw out the whole capitalist, whatever there is of a capitalist system and a market system and so on. Take someone like that. Uh, They're still reformists. I mean, all the people you mentioned are still in favor of, say, developing a decent health care system through government intervention because that's the only option today. Uh, none of them say, let's not improve lives for people because we'd like to see a revolutionary change. Uh, they'd all be in favor, for example, uh, t- take, say, uh, OSHA, you know, uh, safety and health uh, roles in the workplace. I mean, especially under, for years, it's been declining. Under Bush, it's practically disappeared. Uh, but everyone you mentioned would be in favor of strengthening those regulations. They're government regulations. Uh, because what you're in favor of, if you're serious, and the people you mentioned are, is pressing the institutions to their limits, seeing what they can achieve when they're... You're not going to get mass popular movements trying to overthrow the institutions until people recognize they cannot satisfy our needs. Okay, therefore you try to press reform as far as possible within the structure of existing institutions. Meanwhile, uh, developing alternative institutions from within, building the future in the present society that goes on simultaneously. Right. That, that's sort of, sort of what the next question was. Um, in an email conversation you and I had, you said that libertarian socialism is a long-term goal, one that you and I both, I think, agree with is, is a good goal. What should we be doing from within towards the long-term goal of libertarian socialism? Partly it's educational, partly it's uh, organizational. So at the educational dimension, uh, what we would do and have to do is, first of all, develop our own visions of a future society uh, and uh, try to learn about them and try to get others to understand them, try to get others to contribute their understanding of them. That's educational programs. At the organizational side, we should be simply developing alternative institutions. Uh, For example, uh, uh, self-managed workplaces with uh, sharing of uh, uh, work roles. Uh, Robin Hannell, who you mentioned, is one of the people who's done a lot of work on this, as Michael Albert and others. Yeah, we can do that. And a lot of it's going on. There's a recent book by uh, Garl Perovitz uh, reviewing uh, initiatives of that kind all over the country. So it's both. Both develop the uh, understanding of some better future for yourself and for others, uh, and you also try to work towards uh, constructing it. In my own personal opinion, I think the great question of not only you know, practical politics, but of political theory, or is how do you balance the needs of liberty and equality? Because those two impulses always seem to be in conflict. Conservatism would put an, sort of an extreme emphasis on individual liberty and sort of neglect equality. And liberals, you could argue, probably want a little bit of both. And radicals, or they're anarchists, communists, or socialists, would, in some sense, 
lean more toward equality over liberty. I'm just curious to know from you, how do you think, first off, do you think there is a tension between liberty and equality? And secondly, how do we best create a society that balances those two tensions? The idea that there's a conflict between them is uh, ideological dogma. We don't know that there's a conflict between them. And in fact, uh, classical liberals didn't think there was. So take, say, Adam Smith, who uh, we're supposed to revere but not read. Uh, huh. His... Uh, you know, one of his core arguments for markets, he had rather nuanced arguments for markets, but one of the basic ones was that, uh, as he said, in a uh, free society, uh, markets will lead to equality. And he meant equality of outcome. Not equality of opportunity. No, he meant equality of outcome, which he took for granted to be a desideratum. Uh, well, that was one of his core arguments for markets. Uh, the uh, Under particular social and economic conditions, you get different results. Uh, but... Uh, I don't think there's anything general that can be said about this. Well, I was going to say, because Adam Smith, and, and I actually did read my Adam Smith, one of the reasons he believed in markets was because he was anti-monopoly and that he viewed you know, these concentrations of power as inherently dangerous to liberty. Is that accurate? That's correct. And he was opposed to uh, mercantilist structures, which have been reconstructed in many ways in co modern corporations. Yeah, he was strongly opposed to that. In fact, when the modern corporation was introduced by state power about a century ago, classical liberals, conservatives as they were often called, bitterly condemned it as a return to feudalism. Thank you very much, Professor Chomsky, uh, for coming on Equal Time for Free Thought today. This has been truly an honor and a privilege, and maybe hopefully you'll come back on our show someday, and thank you very much. Okay, glad to talk to you. Bye-bye.